Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space, part of our MOS at Home programming. My name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means that I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, hello, thanks for joining us today. Unfortunately, I'm unable to see your comments on either of those platforms at this time. We're so delighted to have all of you here today as our audience. Let's meet our guides for today's journey through space. Hi everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be uh, your guide today, which means I'll be doing most of the talking, but I cannot do this alone. Hi everyone, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be flying you through the solar system. And uh, so we're going to start off in space uh, around a, a very familiar place, Earth, hopefully very familiar, um, our home planet. And there's a lot about Earth that is unique in our solar system. You know, there's a lot that goes on on Earth that doesn't really happen anywhere else. Um, Earth has large oceans. Earth has this thick atmosphere, but not too thick. It has life, all of which affects what goes on on its surface. But there are some things that we think of as being, you know, very distinctive of Earth, which happen in one form or another, another um, in other places in the solar system as well. And one of these is weather. So Earth, of course, has all kinds of crazy weather. It's got uh, blizzards, it's got snowstorms, it's got um, hurricanes, blizzards and snowstorms are the same thing, um, hurricanes, it's got tornadoes, it's got all sorts of crazy weather. Uh, and weather is something that happens other places in the solar system as well, just not always the same way that it happens here on Earth. For instance, when it rains or snows here on the Earth, um, it's water that comes from the sky. Now it rains and snows other places in the solar system as well, but it rains and snows all sorts of weird things like sulfuric acid or sulfur crystals uh, as like a snow or uh, methane raindrops or diamonds or the entire atmosphere. So there's all sorts of crazy things that happen uh, when it comes to weather in the solar system, and that's going to be some of the things we talk about today. Now, Earth, of course, um, can generate some pretty amazing storms. We've had one heck of a hurricane season this year, and of course, those of us in New England are very well versed in uh, blizzards. So Earth, you know, has some pretty epic storms, but if you're thinking about storms in the solar system, someplace other than Earth, if you're thinking about storms, is there any place in particular that jumps into your mind? Go ahead and write an answer in the Q&A if you have one. If you don't and you would like to just put a question mark, you may feel free to do that as well. Just think about places, if you're thinking about storms in the solar system, if there's anywhere that jumps to mind. Hmm, doesn't look like anybody has any thoughts yet. Maybe they should be thinking big. Oh, yeah, Quinn says Jupiter. Um, I like, I like my moment is exactly when that person, thanks right. Quinn. Well, that's usually what, and that's usually what people think of when they think of storms in the solar system, because of course, one of the most famous storms in the solar system is on Jupiter. So Katie's going to go ahead and fly us to Jupiter. And Jupiter is a very different world than the earth. Earth, of course, is a rocky planet. It's not that big as planets go. Saturn, or sorry, Jupiter is a gas planet. It's huge. It could fit over a thousand Earths inside of it. And it doesn't really have a solid surface. So that is one way it is very, very different from the Earth. It also spins very quickly. Um, it takes Earth 24 hours to spin once. Jupiter spins in only about 10 hours. And that rapid spinning actually means you've got a lot of air moving very quickly, which is great for making storms. So Jupiter is covered in storm systems. Um, but what Katie's doing now is she's rotating Jupiter. She's fast forwarding time to rotate Jupiter so that we can find that very famous storm on its surface, 
which is, of course, the Great Red Spot. And there it is. So the Great Red Spot, very accurately named, it is a giant red spot on the surface of Jupiter. Now this is a spinning storm, a cyclonic storm, kind of like a hurricane on the Earth, um, except also not at all like a hurricane. For one thing, when you're, what you're seeing here is actually a hole in the clouds. It's where you're actually seeing a deeper layer um, in the atmosphere. There, it's more like a vortex where you're seeing those red, those red clouds are actually a deeper layer in the atmosphere because this storm is kind of like a big hole. Um, it's, it is spinning again, like a hurricane, but uh, in terms of size, it's a bit different from any hurricane we've ever seen on the earth. And that has to do with the fact that it is in fact it, the size of the earth. Its uh, size has changed over time. It has been as big as three Earths wide. Right now it's more like one Earth wide. Um, but this storm also doesn't really have anything to stop it. So if you think about hurricanes, you know, they may last for a couple of weeks as they churn over the ocean and then they hit land. And once they're over land, they can't draw up energy from the way they could from the ocean and they eventually peter out. That doesn't really happen as much with these storms on the gas planets. They do peter out, they do appear and disappear, but this storm is at least 400 years old because it's just been powering itself. It doesn't have any land masses beneath it to stop it from drawing up energy and continuing. So that, that is um, one way that, the, a couple of ways that this storm is a bit different from a hurricane on Earth. And I'm going to go ahead and show you, um, we've been getting some great up close pictures of it. We have a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter right now. Its name is Juno. And it has gotten some really great up close, relatively recent shots. So the picture on the right is from Juno um, as it flew over the Great Red Spot. And you can see all of the different uh, swirls. And it's really a beautiful, beautiful storm. And then over on the left, is a, a Hubble photograph that was taken recently. So that's from this summer of Jupiter. And you can see the great red spot, much uh, smaller and tighter than it appears in our um, simulated program that Katie is using. You can see below it here, another very large storm. This one was called Red Spot Junior because it was red at one point. You can see it's not anymore. Um, that means that the storm is not reaching quite as deep a layer in the clouds anymore. And one thing that they're keeping an eye on is this up here in the upper hemisphere. This looks like it could develop into a very fascinating storm. Um, so they're keeping an eye on that because Jupiter is always spawning new storms. Jupiter is a storm factory. It's just great for making storms. So that is one place if you want to talk about weather, you can talk about some really crazy, very long term weather. Because again, these storms take a long time to dissipate. But there are other places in the solar system where you can find some really epic storms as well. The gas giants in general are great places to go look for storms. And that means, Katie, we can go visit my favorite planet, which is the next one out, Saturn. Now Saturn is not as famous for storms as Jupiter is. It doesn't have a storm like the Great Red Spot that is very, very distinctive and noticeable on its surface um, and has been raging for centuries. Saturn actually, you know, when you're talking about Saturn, you're usually talking about the rings. But Saturn is a gas planet, which means, and it's uh, like Jupiter, a very rapidly spinning gas planet. Um, and Katie is getting us into position to look at what is in fact a very long-term storm on Saturn. It's just all the way up at the North Pole. So the, we call this the polar hexagon. It's actually a very geometrically shaped storm. Um, it's pretty, actually pretty even. It's, and we think it's caused by jet streams. Um, circulating around the northern part of Saturn. And I can go ahead, we have gorgeous pictures of this as well because we did have a spacecraft in orbit around Saturn for 13 years. Its name was Cassini. It's one of my all-time favorite space missions. And it took these shots. 
So here you can see the entire polar hexagon, actually quite even, as I said, it's remarkably um, evenly shaped. And then at the center is this thing, which you can see in close up over on the right, uh, a, a different kind of polar vortex than we have to deal with here on the earth, but a really epic spinning storm, spinning right at the North Pole of Saturn. And this is probably another one of these very, very, very long lasting storm systems. We don't know as much about this one because we can't observe it from Earth. We can't really see Saturn's North Pole from Earth, unlike Jupiter where we can see the great red spot from Earth. We really only got to get good looks at this polar storm while we had a spacecraft in orbit around Saturn and we don't at the moment. So how this storm evolves over time is gonna be harder for us to observe. But that doesn't mean that we don't get to see evolving storms on Saturn. I'm gonna share with you another set of images. So back in uh, late 2010, early 2011, a fairly epic storm formed in Saturn's Northern hemisphere and then it wrapped itself all the way around the hemisphere. So you can see it in December 5th, it's not there. Here you can see it starting to form. Here's one of the best shots of it. Uh, it sort of has a head that's, and then a streaming tail. And that tail eventually by May had wrapped all the way around the Northern hemisphere of Saturn, the entire hemisphere was wrapped up in this one storm. So this is a very different kind of storm than we see with say the Great Red Spot or the polar hexagon on Saturn, which are very contained. This was not, it grew, it spread. It also uh, dissolved pretty quickly because you can see by August, it's, start, it's not nearly so clear. So one of the great things about watching these planets from Earth is that we can see how their weather systems change over time. And I've got a great example of that in a moment, but if we're gonna talk about Saturn, I can't not talk about Titan. So Titan is a moon of Saturn. It's the largest moon of Saturn. And unlike pretty much every other moon in the solar system, it has a very thick, dense atmosphere. So it's, it's actually so thick that you can't really see the surface. So on the left there, we have a shot of Saturn as it was seen by Cassini, the Cassini spacecraft, and all you can see are clouds. But we really wanted to know what was going on on the surface, so we did land a spacecraft on it. So that picture on the right is actually a photo of the surface of Titan. And on its way to the surface, this spacecraft uh, saw lakes, lakes of liquid methane, um, that landed in a, a mud puddle, a methane mud puddle. We know that it rains methane on Titan. And this actually makes Titan's weather more like Earth's than pretty much anywhere else in the solar system. Because although, you know, you've got these spinning storms on Saturn and Jupiter, which are kind of like uh, spinning storms on Earth, they don't have a lot in common with the kinds of weather that we see on Earth. The weather that you see on Titan is actually a lot more Earth-like than almost anywhere else in the solar system. It's just not water-based, it's methane-based. And so that's one of the reasons we really want to go back and visit Titan in a little more detail, which we're gonna do in the 2030s. So it's gonna be a while, but we do have a mission to send uh, another spacecraft. It's gonna be actually a, a drone, it's gonna fly on Titan, which is, I think, really, really cool. So that's my favorite planet, Saturn, and its beautiful uh, rings, its crazy polar hexagon, its wonderful moon, Titan. But what about the other gas giants? I mean, Uranus and Neptune. I don't really hear about them as much. In fact, if you've ever seen a picture of, of Uranus, odds are, wasn't a very impressive picture. Katie, can we go visit Uranus? Uranus is the seventh planet out from the sun. It orbits at about 2 billion miles from the sun. So it's about 20 times as far from the sun as Earth is. 
And many times when you see a picture of Uranus, like I said, it's pretty featureless. Looks a lot like this. You might see some, some white clouds. You might be able to see some layering. That's because most of our really good close-up views of Uranus come from the Voyager 2 spacecraft. Voyager 2 flew past Uranus in the 80s. And back in the 80s, it was uh, springtime in the northern hemisphere of Uranus, sort of autumn in the southern hemisphere, basically the in-between seasons where the temperature uh, differences are not quite as extreme. And that seems to be then the time that the weather on Uranus is very, very calm, relatively speaking. It is still, you know, a freezing cold gas giant. So, um, but think about summer here in Boston or really anywhere in the United States. What happens, what do you see a lot more of in the summer that you don't see as much of in the fall or the spring in terms of weather? Think about weather here on the earth. Go ahead and put an answer in the Q&A. If you have one, you may always feel free to put a question mark. Poppy says flowers. Flowers. Oh yes, you do see a lot more flowers. Unfortunately, we're not gonna see flowers on Uranus because like Jupiter, it is a gas giant. It doesn't have a surface. Mm. And Quinn says sun and green leaves and Isora just has a question mark. So you do get a lot of sun and it turns out Uranus gets even more crazy sun in the summer than other planets do because it's tilted all the way over on its side. Earth is a little bit tilted. That's why we get seasons. Uranus is tilted all the way over on its side. So when it's summer in the Northern hemisphere on Titan, the North pole, or sorry, on Uranus, the North pole of Uranus is pointed directly at the sun. And that, it turns out, leads to some crazy weather, which Voyager never got to see, and therefore, which we don't have great pictures of, at least nothing up close. But what we do have is shots from Earth. So here's our picture of Titan. I'm going to jump us ahead. Here we have on the left, that's Uranus, as photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you might notice it looks a little bit different than it did when Katie was just showing us uh, Uranus out in space. It's got, a, got this cap, this little hat of clouds. That's the Northern Hemisphere. And it's covered in a storm, a giant storm that takes up most of the Northern Hemisphere. This is a version of Uranus we've never seen up close. This summertime or wintertime Uranus where there's just this massive cap of storms covering almost half the planet. This is one of the reasons a lot of uh, scientists would love to send new spacecraft out to visit the outer gas giants because we've never seen those up close. They're the ones we know the least about. It's not just Uranus, it's also Neptune, which you can see next to Uranus here over on the right. Uh, this is also from Voyager 2. It does showcase a nice storm on Neptune, which we call the Great Dark Spot, and it no longer exists. It's gone. This storm dissipated since Voyager 2 visited this planet back in 1989. So these planets are actually changing a lot over time, and these two outer planets are a place we don't know that much about, and we would love to get to know a little more so we could learn more about these weather systems, especially this evolving Uranus that we really haven't gotten to see before. So that's some crazy weather, um, crazy storm systems on the gas planets. I did mention before uh, in terms of things coming at raining from the sky, I did mention diamonds. Uh, we think Uranus and Neptune are places where it rains diamonds if you go down deep enough into the atmosphere. We think that um, there's enough carbon in the atmosphere that the pressure from the weight of all that atmosphere will put, crush it into diamonds. And you might sound like a great thing having, you know, diamonds raining from the sky until you remember that diamonds are really, really hard rocks. And really, really hard rocks raining from the sky sounds terrible. 
But another thing I mentioned coming out of the sky, raining down from the sky, is the atmosphere itself. And we're going to pull back a bit to talk about where that happens. And it's a place that you've probably heard of. It is, in fact, a place that you're probably quite fond of because it certainly seems to have a big fan club. It's that one out there with the wacky orbit, Pluto. So Pluto is not a planet, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have weather, its own kind of weather, as we've seen with Titan, not just planets have weather. So Pluto's orbit is very different from the orbits of the planets, which are nice and round um, and have the sun not perfectly at the center. None of them have the sun perfectly at the center, but they're very, very close to having the sun perfectly at the center. Pluto, you can immediately see here, is much closer to the sun at some points in its orbit than it is at others. So that means Pluto actually has very, very different conditions on its surface at some points than others. When it's close to the sun, which it, it's on its way out now, it's still pretty close to the sun, it has an atmosphere. And the New Horizons spacecraft was even able to see it as it flew past Pluto in 2015, this hazy layer. It's not a thick atmosphere like we have on Earth, but it's definitely there. But what about the other end? When it's really far from the sun, it's a lot colder at that point. And that atmosphere actually turns to snow and snows down to the surface, which means the very air itself actually rains down onto the surface of Pluto. Uh, at certain points in its orbit, which is a thing we don't see really anywhere else that we know of in the solar system, the entire atmosphere turning to snow and falling to the surface. And then as Pluto proceeds through its orbit and it starts to get close to the sun again, that atmosphere that has turned into snow and is sitting on the surface will turn back into gas and Saturn or Pluto will regrow an atmosphere as it gets closer to the sun again. So remember, Pluto's got an almost 250 year orbit, so this doesn't happen quickly, but its whole atmosphere will snow to the ground and then return to the air as uh, it goes through its orbit. Now, these are some pretty crazy weather conditions we've been talking about, including, you know, these storms on Saturn that wrapped around the Northern Hemisphere. We've got Uranus with its cap of storms covering the entire Northern Hemisphere. But again, those are hemispheres. Those aren't the entire planet. There is a place in the solar system where you will find storms that will cover the entire world. It's just a different kind of storm than you might be thinking of. And to visit that, we're going to go a lot closer to home. In fact, we're only going to go out one planet to Mars. So Katie, let's take us to Mars. Now, Mars has an atmosphere. It has a very, very, very thin atmosphere. So not like Earth, it's very thin. And Mars is a very dry place. So you're not getting rainstorms. You're not really even getting snowstorms, although you do find ice at the poles. Um, so you're not getting the kind of storms that we see on Earth, but that doesn't mean you're not getting storms. One thing Mars does have is wind and dust. In fact, the dust on Mars is very, very fine. It's more like a powder, which makes it very easy, even though the wind on Mars is not very strong, to lift that dust into the air. So Mars has a lot of dust storms. They're very common, but just occasionally, you don't just get a, a, a small dust storm, you get a global dust storm. Mars is one of the only places in the solar system where you will find something, a storm that will cover the entire planet. So we're gonna take a look. These are from 2001, taken just uh, about five weeks apart from each other, six weeks apart. Mars went from looking perfectly normal to not being able to see any surface features whatsoever. A dust storm covered the entire planet and it covered it for months. These are not short-lived storms. Um, these, the dust stays in the air for months to over a year, an Earth year. And this turned out to have consequences for one of our missions, not the one in 2001, but it happened again in uh, 2018. 
And this had consequences because, let me show you what happens to the sun. You see less and less and less of the sun as more and more dust enters the air. And that could, turned out to be a problem for the Opportunity rover. Opportunity was one of our most successful space missions. Uh, it landed on Mars in 2004 and it was supposed to make it to for three months and it made it until 2018. So it really did a great job. It lasted for 14 years on Mars and this was the storm that killed it. It was solar powered. It needed to see the sun in order to have the power it needed to run. And for nine months, it really couldn't see the sun during this epic dust storm in 2018 on Mars, which covered the entire planet. And this is what ultimately led to the end of the Opportunity mission, which was very sad for me because I really loved that little rover. Now the Curiosity rover on Mars was fine because it did not depend on the sun. It has nuclear power. It can generate its own power without depending on the sun. So it survived the storm and is still rolling along pretty happily. I see that we are starting to run out of time. So we've jumped all around the solar system. We've talked about many different types of weather on different planets and moons and dwarf planets. Janine, were there any questions along the way that I should try to answer before we finish? No, I think we covered them all. I just will say that Rahul will be very happy that we went to Mars because they were wanting to go there from the beginning. So. Excellent. Well, can't talk about weather without talking about dust storms on Mars. All righty. Well, thanks so much for taking us on that journey through space. Um, I'll let you guys say goodbye to everybody. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we hope you had fun. I'm sorry we didn't get to um, go to all of the places in the solar system, but I think we got to all of the ones that anybody asked about. So that's a pretty good day for a tour, I think. Um, if you would like to see other virtual programs like this or see what else we're offering, you can follow the museum on our social media channels or check out www.mos.org slash MOS at home. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel, turn on notifications and never miss any live streams that we ever do, which is pretty fun. Um, if you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support more programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. And thank you to all of you who have. Today's program was produced using the free software Worldwide Telescope, which you can find at worldwidetelescope.org. Thank you all for participating and we hope you'll join us again soon.